Welcome back to the Michael Lofton Show on a Monday here on Reason and Theology. I want to engage an article by Dr. Ed Fazer, uh, posted July 15th, uh, so just two days ago. And it is posted on the Catholic World Report. The title of the article is Cardinal Newman, Archbishop Fernandez, and the Suspended Magisterium Thesis. I only address this because quite a few people asked me to do a show on this, so evidently it's creating quite a stir. So I would like to engage it. Let me share my screen, and that way you can kind of follow along. Let's briefly go through the article. It's not very long, so it shouldn't, shouldn't take long. Okay. He begins, St. John Henry Newman famously noted that during the Arian crisis, the governing body of the church came short in fighting the heresy. And orthodoxy was preserved primarily by the laity. Let me stop there. That's half true. Partly true. Uh, but of course, it was not preserved by the laity alone. But also faithful from the College of Bishops, so faithful bishops, and then faithful popes which we'll address Liberius here in a moment. But um, I want to say very, very clearly, even during the Arian crisis, you do not have a suspended magisterium. You do not have an eclipse of the magisterium. If what we mean by that is that the two organs of the magisterium, that is the Pope and the College of Bishops, did not do their job. Now, he's going to talk about that here in a little, little bit. So I'm going to interact with it, but I just want to be very clear on what do we mean by suspended magisterium? Do we mean, as Newman was saying, that some among the College of Bishops were failing to carry out their duties and teach the truth, and thus the laity had to pick up the slack? That's true. And that's not unique to the Arian crisis period. There are other times in church history where we could say the same. But there were always still those among the College of Bishops who were still persevering in the truth and teaching the truth, as well as the Sea of Rome that was preaching the truth. Uh, so the teaching church was not suspended in that sense. It was still teaching, and it was still active. We could just say that some members of the College of Bishops were suspending their personal magisterium. That's how I understand Newman, and that, I would say, doesn't apply to anything that's going on um, with what we're going to see here in the article in a moment. Uh, but he continues, the Catholic people, he says, were the obstinate champions of Catholic truth, and the bishops were not. Could we say that, generally speaking, of many of the bishops? Yes. But obviously, there were still some among the College of Bishops who preserved the faith, who were still teaching. So it, was, it wasn't the case that the entire episcopate and the papacy was at war with tradition, and it was the laity who came and saved the day. That's not what he's saying. Even Pope Liberius temporarily caved into pressure to accept an ambiguous formula and to condemn St. Athanasius, the great champion of orthodoxy. It's not exactly true. Um, I don't have the time to reproduce it, but if you want details on this, go right here. St. Robert Bellarmine on um, the Roman Pontiff, Volume 1, or Tome 1, I should say. He goes over this in great detail, um, and he does note that what Pope Liberius signed was not an ambiguous formula, but was Catholic, and he cites patristic witness for that. So that is in error. As far as a condemnation of Athanasius, that part is true, and he addresses why um, that wasn't consistent with his magisterium, although it was a mistake. Uh, but it is certainly a fault that we can attribute to Liberius. But it was not that he was teaching heresy, that he was teaching Arianism, or that he signed an ambiguous, ambiguous formula, or that, as some others say, that he signed a heretical formula. It was none of the above. What he signed was Catholic in nature. And again, he cites patristic references for that. Newman wrote, the body of the episcopate was unfaithful to its commission. And we could say that about 
many among the college of bishops, but not the entire college of bishops. While the body of the laity was faithful to its baptism, and likewise we could say that about maybe many among the laity, but not all of the laity. At one time, the Pope, at other times, a patriarchal, metropolitan, or great see, and at other times, general councils said what they should not have said or did what obscured and compromised revealed truth. And notice when he says re general councils, he's not talking about how we would use that term for general councils that we would accept. While on the other hand, it was the Christian people who under providence were the ecclesiastical strength of Athanasius, Hilary, Eusebius, and other great solitary confessors who would have failed without them. I, and I, I don't buy that. I don't buy that. I, I don't agree with that. The magisterium would not have failed. As Newman emphasized, this is perfectly consistent with the claim that the Pope and bishops might, in spite of this error, be infallible in their ex cathedra decisions. Ex cathedra means from the chair, from their teaching authority. Ex cathedra could mean multiple things. It could mean what we tend to refer to now as infallible teachings, or it could just mean authoritative teachings. It depends on how a person is using it. Again, a lot of people now, when they hear ex cathedra, they automatically hear infallible. That's not always the case. The problem is not that they made an ex cathedra pronouncements and somehow erred anyway. The problem is that there was an extended period during which in their non ex cathedra, and here Phaser interprets that as thus non infallible statements and actions, they persistently failed to do their duty. But that's not actually what Newman said. He didn't say in their non definitive yet authoritative teachings they're failing to do their duties. He didn't exactly say that. Uh, in particular, Newman says, there was a temporary suspense of the functions of the teaching church. The body of bishops failed in their confession of faith. I think this is hyperbolic. I don't think that this is actually accurate unless we're just speaking hyperbolically. They spoke variously one against another. There was nothing after Nicaea or of firm, unvarying, consi consistent testimony for nearly 60 years. Among some of the bishops, yeah. But I would say there were still those who were faithful among the College of Bishops, and there was still the papacy that was faithful. And so you still have the universal authority and the universal organs, the two organs, the universal um, uh, teaching authority of the Pope and the College of Bishops. You still have faithful among the College who are, are teaching, and thus the College of Bishops is still intact. But... Might that be true hyperbolically insofar as many members of the College of Bishops were not being faithful? Yeah, many members of the College of Bishops were not being faithful. But we can't say that the College of Bishops itself was somehow unfaithful. That wouldn't follow. Newman goes on to make it clear that he is not saying the Pope and Bishops lost the power to teach. And in a way that was protected from error when exercised in an ex cathedra fashion. Now, I've challenged that thesis from Phaser already, which he has not responded to. But I've already done a video challenging this because I've pointed out that the magisterium itself notes there is a protection and assistance of the Holy Spirit to non infallible teachings as well. And I, I think he needs to grapple with that. Rather, while they retained that power, they simply did not use it. And again, is that the case for some? Yeah. But as as far as the organ as a whole, I would not. I would not go that far. As far as the organ as a whole. No. The organ of the College of Bishops, the organ of the Papal Magisterium, I wouldn't go far, that far and say that. In recent years, some have borrowed Newman's language and suggested that with the pontificate of Pope Francis, we are once again in a period during which the exercise of the magisterium or teaching authority of the church has been temporary suspe temporarily suspended. Now, some people are asserting that as a convenient excuse to ignore non-definitive yet authoritative teachings that they don't like, uh, which is another form of Protestantism. Uh, so this is their convenient way of getting around it. They'll just say, well, it wasn't taught infallibly, so I can ignore it. Except the fact that the magisterium itself tells you that that's not the case. 
except for the fact that it tells you religious submission of intellect and will is owed to non-definitive teachings. Um, and the church is teaching non-definitively constantly. Constantly. So there is no temporary suspension of the magisterium for anybody who would propose that. Now, the suspended magisterium thesis is not correct as a completely general description of Francis's pontificate, Fazer says. For there clearly are cases where he has exercised his magisterial authority, such as when, acting under papal authorization, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith under its current prefect, uh, Cardinal Ladaria, has issued various teaching documents. I thought that was a weird thing to say by Fazer. I thought that was odd. And you'll see, you'll see kind of why in a little bit. But I thought this was weird because what's the principal way that the Pope teaches? Is it vicariously through congregations or is it personally? The answer is the latter. It's personally. Obviously, he could do so vicariously in two ways, through a congregation and again in two ways here, either in common form or specific form. What that means is the congregations are there to assist him in his ministry. And say with the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, formerly known as the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. With the DDF, it's there to assist him. But it has no teaching, teaching authority in and of itself. It cannot teach. The DDF cannot teach on its own initiative and by its own name. The DDF has released documents in its own name before. But we recognize that they're non-authoritative. Uh, I'll give you an example of that. The commentary on the Professio Fidei. That's a perfect example. That's actually a commentary about Bertone and Ratzinger. It's not uh, papally approved. It's issued under the offices of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith at the time. What does all this mean? Well, what it means is this. The dicastery cannot teach. It does not have authority. It is not a magisterial organ. It has no teaching authority. The dicastery becomes authoritative and magisterial only if the Pope approves of it in one of two ways. In common form, that is, he just approves of the general idea of the document of the congregation. Or in specific form, which is he's approving everything in there line by line. In other words, he's making that his own personal words. So it's a little bit more specific. Uh, but either way, it becomes part of his papal magisterium. Now, obviously, in common form, is going to be lower in the papal magisterium versus something in specific form. That would obviously be higher in weight. Either way, they're both still authoritative, and they're part of the papal magisterium either way, though they may have varying degrees of authority and weight. So the congregation has no teaching authority, and it's not even the ordinary mode by which the Pope teaches. Whenever the Pope accepts in common form or specific form the DDF and, and maybe a teaching document, um, he makes it his own magisterium. The congregation has no magisterium on its own because there's only two organs of the magisterium. The Pope, the College of Bishops. The dicastery is not the College of Bishops. The dicastery is at the service of the papal magisterium. So if it is authoritative, it is because the, the Pope has approved of it in one of two forms, and it thus then becomes part of the papal magisterium. Now, that is a vicarious way in which the Pope can teach through a congregation. That is not necessarily the ordinary mode by which the Pope teaches. How does the Pope ordinarily teach? Personally, through himself, all the time. Um, now, it can take place in various occasions through various forms of media. It could be, in some cases, a homily, though that would be pretty low level. Uh, it could be, you know, in other cases, an apostolic constitution. Um, and obviously, there's a whole wide range in between. But the Pope is teaching constantly in plenty of occasions outside of the congregation for the doctrine of the faith, now known as the dicastery for the doctrine of the faith. Why am I belaboring this point? You'll see why here in a moment. But I thought that was such an odd thing to say, like,
to acknowledge Pope Francis's magisterium, his authoritative magisterium, and say, well, it has been exercised whenever he's issued certain um, teachings through the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. I was thinking, that's odd. This Pope has released quite a few magisterial documents and teaches every single week, multiple times a week, that is part of the papal magisterium. So I thought that was an odd way to point to his magisterium. You'll see why there's this confusion later on. To be sure, there may be nonetheless uh, particular cases where the suspended magisterium characterization is plausible. Consider the heat of controversy that followed upon Amor Satitia. Hmm. Amor Satitia, which is filled with papal magisterial teaching. Is it not? Yes, it is. That is a magisterial act and a teaching act of the magisterium, is it not? Yes, it is. Yeah. That That's odd that he's bringing up a more satitia now after talking about the papal magisterium. Watch why. And in particular, the dubia issued by four cardinals asking the Pope to reaffirm several points of irreformable doctrine that Amoris seems to conflict with. Stop. Stop. You know what this reminds me of? It's like James White, the Protestant James White. I always have to pick on James White because he's the perfect example of this. James White has not updated his theology since the 90s. James White is giving the same talking points that he's been giving six, since the 90s. He has not listened to any response. James White is like a computer that has been disconnected from the internet, you know, in, in maybe 1995 when they had the internet, <laughs> okay? I think it was around in 95. It was just coming around, all right? It got online for like a couple of days, and then it disconnected from the internet, and it's been sitting, you know, it's been sitting on a shelf, all right? Since 1995 unto the present, it's never updated. And you plug that thing back in, and it's still running like some DOS program from, <laughs> from antiquity, right? It hasn't updated anything. Okay, that's James White. He he just has not, he's he hasn't listened to anything that his cr critics have said. He hasn't accounted for any of it. He just gives the same talking points that are outdated. Okay, why is it? that we're still giving these outdated talking points in Catholic circles about Amor Satitia, as if there hasn't been a considerable amount of responses already to this. Why is it as if we've just disconnected and unplugged ourselves from all feedback, and we just continue to repeat the same stuff over and over and over and over and over? Amor Satitia, as I showed, and I'm not the only one to do it, go to my video, The Truth About Amor Satitia. Go and watch that video. In the video I showed, the dubia, four of the five questions were unnecessary because four of the five questions were already directly answered in Amor Satitia. So there was no reason to even ask them. They're already answered. One question was actually of substance. That was a legitimate question. And as I've demonstrated, Pope Francis has already answered that for us. So why do we still continue to bring this up? I don't know, but watch how it serves an agenda here. As for Father Hunwick has noted, because Pope Francis has persistently refused to answer these dubia, no, four of the five was already addressed in there. Therefore, they were unnecessary to ask. Here's the, here, here's the response for four out of five to the dubia. See Amor Satitia. That's your answer. R read it again. You didn't read it carefully the first time. Read it again more carefully. Now you have four of the five answered already. For the only one that was legitimate, that has already been answered. It, it's not hard. Okay. Pope Francis has persistently refused to answer these dubia. He can plausibly be said to, at least to that extent, to have suspended the exercise of his magisterium. Um, what? What? 
Pope Francis is teaching constantly. He hasn't suspended the magisteria. Amor Satitia is still authoritative, and there were plenty of things after Amor Satitia that he has taught authoritatively. He hasn't suspended the magisterium. It's just that these guys aren't paying attention. They're not listening to their critics. They're not listening to feedback. They're just James White repeating the same arguments over and over and over. Again, this does not mean that he has lost his teaching authority. Okay. The point is rather that insofar as he has refused to answer these five specific questions put to him. No. He has not, at least with respect to those particular questions, actually exercised that authority. That doesn't even logically follow. This is just poor logic. Let's say that Pope Francis has not sufficiently answered those five questions. There is no suspended magisterium here because there still is the magisterium of Amor Satitia and everything else after that and prior to that. And so this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. As, far, uh, as Father Hunwick notes, he could do so at any time so that his teaching authority remains. Again, I refer everybody back to this video right here, Amor Satitia. The answer to four of those five is, read more carefully. Go back over Amor Satitia again. You didn't have to ask the question. Again, though, it doesn't follow that the suspended magisterium thesis is correct as a general description of Pope Francis's pontificate up to now. However, recently there has been a new development which it seems to me could make the thesis more plausible as a characterization of the remainder of Francis's pontificate. So Phaser is distinguishing himself a little bit from what we just saw there with Hunwick. He's distinguishing himself from that and saying, well, that doesn't fully really account for the whole phenomenon of Pope Francis and his magisterium. But it might be characteristic of his magisterium moving forward. Why does he say that? Well, let's see. The Pope has announced that Cardinal Lideria will soon be replaced by Archbishop Fernandez as prefect of what is now called the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith. Fernandez is a controversial figure, in part because he is widely thought to have ghostwritten Amor Satitia. Um, again, I cannot emphasize it enough. Please go and watch the truth about Amor Satitia. It's an in-depth presentation, a two-and-a-half-hour presentation that I gave, responding to all of the common misconceptions about Amor Satitia. What is relevant to the present point, however, is what Pope Francis and the Archbishop himself have said about the nature of his role as prefect of the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith. Now, he's about to try to analyze the letter that Pope Francis sent to Fernandez. I'm not going to reproduce the analysis that I've already done on it. I will refer you to it in this video called New Doctrine Chief Archbishop Fernandez, uh, streamed two weeks ago. Go and watch that video. Um, and then, by the way, go and watch the next one that I did. Huge scandal. Uh, Pope Francis appoints kissing book bishop to oversee doctrine. Go and watch that one as well. But if, especially watch the former because that's where I go through the letter, line by line, that Pope Francis wrote to Archbishop Fernandez. And I think shows you a very different take than the one you're going to see from um Phaser. But let's brief, briefly go through it. I entrust to you a task that I consider very valuable. Its central purpose is to guard the teaching that flows from the faith in order to give reasons for our hope, but not as an enemy who critiques and condemns. But first of all, listen to that. To guard the teaching that flows from the faith. And over and over and over, Pope Francis says in the letter, the central purpose of what you're to do is guard the deposit of faith. The dicastery over which you will preside in other times came to use immoral methods. What were those immoral methods? Turns out we found out because there were, there were some questions. What, what, what exactly are we referring to here? Go and read this article. Cardinal Mueller confirms Vatican doctrinal office had filed warning about Archbishop Fernandez. And here you're going to get Fernandez's side of the story when he had to deal with the congregation that was sending him all kinds of petty, ridiculous questions. And it was relatively obnoxious. Go and listen to his account of it. And if you read through it, you'll see that what Pope Francis is saying is, 
yeah, I don't want you doing that to people because that was effectively harassing people. It's one thing to question them about their orthodoxy or about the meaning of something they taught. It's another to do what they did. Go and read it and you'll see. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Those were times when, rather than promoting theological knowledge, possible doctrinal errors were pursued. What I expect from you is certainly something very different. Does that mean that doctrinal errors will no longer be pursued? They will, but not by the means that were used against him. You know that the church grows in her interpretation of the revealed word and in her understanding of truth without this implying the imposition of a single way of expressing it. And as I've demonstrated, what does that mean? That doesn't mean that you don't have a decision on what is right and what is wrong, what is orthodox, what is heterodox. That's not what it means. What it does mean is there are multiple ways of formulating doctrine that has the same meaning and proposition. And we know this to be true. Ut unum sent. Just go and read that. You'll, you'll see it there in John Paul II. He'll know these. Um, or in the instance of the filioque between East and West, there's various formulaic expressions that it can be used to convey the same thing. Or perhaps when we speak about purgatory in the East versus the West, there are going to be different ways in which we speak about it, but we're ultimately going to have the same meaning, or at least we should. If we don't, that's a problem. But that's the point here. There's different ways of expressing the same truth. For differing currents of thought in philosophy, theology, and pastoral practice, if open to being reconciled with the re reconciled by the Spirit. Did you hear that? Th these various formulas, these various ways of expressing theology and philosophy have to be reconciled by the Holy Spirit. You can't just say, well, we have different formulas and we have different ways of teaching the truth, and yet they are in conflict with the deposit of faith or in conflict with each other. That's not what's being said here. They have to be reconciled by the Holy Spirit. And respect and love can enable the church to grow. So when you do have diverse ways of expressing theology and philosophy, as long as they're reconciled with the deposit of faith, that actually can be enriching to the church. This harmonious growth will preserve Christian doctrine more effectively than any control mechanism. Now, I have critiques of this letter that Pope Francis writ, wrote to Fernandez, because I want to say some of the tendencies that I see in Pope Francis here is to kind of pit these things against each other. And I want to say it doesn't necessarily have to be so. Correcting someone's doctrinal error doesn't necessarily have to be a control mechanism or doesn't necessarily have to be something that doesn't allow or enable the church to grow. They're not necessarily mutually exclusive. So I have some criticisms of the, le of the letter and of what looks like Pope Francis's vision for the congregation. And I express them in that video. You're welcome to watch it. The message has to concentrate on the essentials, on what is most beautiful, most grand, most appealing, and at the same time most necessary. You're well aware that there is harmonious order among the truths of our message, and the greatest danger occurs when secondary issues end up overshadowing the central ones. Go and read the letter and check out my commentary on it uh, to get more context for that. There are several points to be noted here, Fazer said. First, the Pope makes it clear that he wants the DDF under Archbishop Fernandez to operate in a different way than it has in the past. Second, he indicates that part of what this entails is that the DDF should focus on essentials and central issues rather than secondary issues. Pope Francis doesn't spell out precisely what this means, but the context indicates that he regards many of the issues the CDF had dealt with in the past to be secondary. Right, but that's not necessarily to say that it's you know, decisions that it made on doctrine that the popes have confirmed or something, those were secondary in nature. Again, I think he's talking more about ways and styles and expressions and formulas, things like that. Third, when the DDF does not address an issue, it should not do so as a control mechanism that pursues possible doctrinal errors or imposes a single way of expressing the faith. Well, there, there is some truth to that, right? I mean, you don't necessarily have to mandate that a person uses the exact same formula, a way of expressing the faith, as long as the meaning is the same. As long as the meaning is the same, 
there could be multiple ways of expressing it. That's legitimate. Um, but I don't necessarily see maybe correcting somebody about a doctrinal error as a control mechanism. So I got a little bit of pushback there uh, for Pope Francis. Fourth, it should speak not as an enemy who critiques and condemns. Now, I got a little pushback there. I get what he's saying. It, it, it's true. You you don't want to, when critiquing others, it, you know, as the DDF, you don't want to be this mean enemy, an ogre. You want to, as a loving father, correct a person. I get that. Um, but I do want to just balance out what's being said there and say, but I want to reassure people that you can still critique and condemn error while not being an enemy and while doing so in a loving way. They're not, they're not mutually exclusive. Um, but perhaps, again, he's referring to the way in which it was done, as in the case with Archbishop Fernandez. In a recent interview, Fernandez has commented on his own understanding of his role as head of the DDF, and his remarks echo and expand upon the Pope's, Fernandez says. So you can imagine that being named in this place is a painful experience. This dicastery that I'm going to lead was the Holy Office, the Inquisition, which even investigated me. There were great theologians at the time of the Second Vatican Council who were persecuted by this institution. That's true. Um, and there's a whole lot that I can say uh, about this issue. Perhaps I'll do a whole show on it. But there were things that the Second Vatican Council taught that ended up vindicating some of the people that were previously not necessarily considered heretics, but there was a negative judgment against them. That doesn't necessarily mean that doctrine changed, by the way, but there's that would be a whole show. Perhaps I'll do that soon. The Pope told me, don't worry, I'll send you a letter explaining that I want to give a different meaning to this dicastery. So th this is Pope Francis saying that's the context behind this letter is the way you were treated when you were investigated by the congregation. you got to keep that in mind when reading this letter. That came out, by the way, after I critiqued it initially. We didn't know about it until Fernandez gave an interview after that. So keep that in mind when you read the letter. That is to promote thought and theological reflection in dialogue with the world in science. That is, instead of persecutions and condemnations, to create spaces for dialogue. And I just want to, again... Offer some little bit of pushback here. You can have both ends. It's not an either word. It's possible to have dialogue and yet still condemn an erroneous thesis. It's possible to still do both. The part the archbishop went on to say that he wants the DDF to avoid all forms of authoritarianism that seek to impose an ideological register, forms of populism that are also authoritarian and unitary thinking. I don't think that he's saying dogma, you know, or uh, definitive teaching or something like that, that that's somehow unitary thinking. That, that's not what he's getting at. It's, again, about more expressions. Because, again, remember he had said in the letter that these various ways of expressing theology have to be reconciled by the Holy Spirit. They have to be reconciled by that author who's the author of the deposit of faith. And the whole point, he says to him, is to guard the deposit of faith in the letter. So he's not saying there is no deposit of faith, truth is relative, there is no uh, right or wrong. He's not saying that. But he's talking about the way in which it's expressed, as long as the meaning is still the same. It is obvious that the history of the Inquisition is shameful because it is harsh and that it is profoundly contrary to the gospel and to the Christian teaching itself. That is why it is so appalling. But current phenomenon must be judged with the criteria of today. And today, everywhere, there are still forms of authoritarianism and the opposition of a single way of thinking. All right, so here's Fazer's commentary on it. Here, too, there are several points to be noted. First, the Pope, uh, like the Pope, the Archbishop indicates that he wants the DDF to move away from the sort of activity that occupied it in the past. But he is a bit more specific than the Pope was. He cites, as examples, investigations of theologians at around the time of Vatican II and the investigation the CDF made of his own views, which, as the interview goes on to make clear, had to do with some things he had written on the topic of homosexuality, which he had sufficiently explained. And by the way, 
again, over and over and over, the holy office did render negative judgments about people who were later on vindicated. Keep that in mind. That's a fact. And it's a fact that we see often. Now, that doesn't mean they always got it wrong. Many times they got it right. And that doesn't mean that they shouldn't render any judgments because they could get it wrong. But it does mean that it's understandable why Pope Francis is saying, I want to get away from some of this aggressiveness. So he doesn't have long ago uh, history in mind, but the recent activity of the CDF. Furthermore, he criticizes even this sort of investigation and not merely harsh methods association with, associated with the Inquisition as a kind of persecution. I didn't see that. I didn't see that in there. I don't know where Phaser is getting that from. Second, the Archbishop says that what the Pope wants is for the DDF not only to avoid such persecutions of individuals, but also to refrain from condemnations of their views. That That's not how I read that either. I think he's reading a little bit too much into this. One can condemn their view without being a condemning type of person, like this mean, nasty ogre. I think that's what Francis is trying to get at. Not that you can't render a judgment. I doubt very seriously that the congregation's never going to render a judgment on somebody's theology. <laughs> I, I can absolutely guarantee we're going to be seeing that. In place of such persecutions and condemnations, he wants dialogue. Right. Third, he takes this to entail that the DDF will refrain from the imposition of a single way of thinking. Right. But that doesn't mean a single way of thinking insofar as the meaning of a proposition or the substance of the faith or rendering a negative judgment against a teaching or something. Again, I already explained where that's coming from. Taking all of Pope Francis's and Archbishop Fernandez's comments into account yields the following. The DDF, which has hitherto been the main magisterial organ of the church. Pause. 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 That is a jaw-dropping error that we're, we're seeing here. And that explained the comment earlier. Did you catch that? Let me read that to you again. The DDF, which has hitherto been the main magisterial organ of the church. What's wrong with that sentence? Can you spot it? Any guesses? Anybody in the chat? I'll give you all a second to put it in there. I need, I need the Jeopardy music. Give you all just a few more seconds here. The DDF, which has hitherto been the main magisterial organ of the church. What is wrong with that? Uh, Horror Hawk says the main organ is the ordinary magisterium. Um, Alexander says, I think he means effectively the primary organ in the sense of what is actually used. Uh, Matthew says it has no authority. Okay. Um, Ma Matthew, you're, you're kind of getting at it right there. And Alexander, your your um, your comment there doesn't still doesn't uh, doesn't help him because that's also still false. Uh, so even if he's saying effectively the primary organ, that's also still false. It's not a primary. It's not an organ at all, and it's not even the primary teaching organ, even if it was. But okay, let me reiterate what I noted earlier. The congregations are not organs of the magisterium because they do not have the authority to teach. They're not organs of the magisterium. Um, in and of themselves, they do not have authority to teach, unless the Pope endows them with that. Uh, they do not have the authority to teach in and of themselves authoritatively. Um, now, what the Pope does, again, is the congregation or the dicastery can write a teaching document and the Pope can choose to promulgate it or not. If it's issued in its own name without papal approbation, it's not magisterial. It's just, a, it's an opinion from the congregation. Take it or leave it. It's an opinion though. Um, now, if the papal, papal approbation is given to it, it then does become part of the papal magisterium, um, either in common form or specific form, either way, papal magisterium. There are two organs in the magisterium, two teaching organs, not dicasteries. The Pope, the College of Bishops, two organs. Give me one second, y'all. 
I gotta take this call. The joys of doing things live, right? Sorry, that was an important call I needed to take for a second there. Okay. The DDF, not an organ of the magisterium. You have two organs, the Pope, College of Bishops. So not only is it not an organ of the magisterium, it can't teach at all unless the Pope approves of it, and then it becomes part of the papal magisterium. Now, if that's what he means... It's still not accurate because that's not the primary mode that the Pope uses to teach. The Pope doesn't use vicarious modes as his primary means to teach. Rather, he uses himself to teach personally more often than vicariously. And Pope Francis has been doing that over and over and over, not only in magisterial documents, but also in speeches and homilies. At least in so far as the ones that go into the AAS. Um, this is revealing a major deficiency on Phaser's part here. And it explained why there was that odd comment earlier. Earlier in the art article was that odd comment that Pope Francis, let me go to it. Let's see here. Uh, it was right around here. For there are clearly are cases where he has exercised his magisterial authority, that is the Pope, such as when acting under papal authorization, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith under its current uh, prefect Cardinal Ladaria has issued various teaching documents. Those are exceptional. I mean, he's he's right, acting under papal authorization, it becomes part of the papal magisterium. But those are exceptional. They're not the common way in which the Pope teaches. The common way is, again, as I noted, personally, which he's doing all the time. He's doing weekly. It, it's as if he thinks that the DDF is a magisterial organ. He does give the qualification earlier, if endowed with papal authority. But it's not an organ. It's inappropriate to call it an organ. And then number two, even if we're just playing with semantics here, it's not the primary mode and means by which the Pope teaches. So, in other words, let's say 10% of the time the Pope teaches vicariously through the DDF. And 90% of the time he teaches personally. If you're limiting most of papal teaching to that 10%, you're now missing out on 90%. That, that could be a huge problem. We'll in, future, uh, we'll in future focus on central, essential doctrinal matters and pay less attention to secondary ones, talking about the congregation. Uh, where it does address some such matter, will it approach it by way of ferreting out doctrinal errors or imposing a single view? We'll, emphasize, uh, we'll emphasize dialogue with individual thinkers rather than investigation, critique, and condemnation of their views. I don't, I don't think any of this follows, by the way, from, from the letter should in all these respects be understood as playing a role very different from the one played by the CDF in recent decades. Now you'll see why I belabored all this, because here's where it really counts. In short, I'm sorry, in short, this May magisterial organ of the church will largely no longer be exercising its magisterial authority. It doesn't have magisterial authority. We, we already acknowledge that it has to be through the Pope, and so it's actually papal magisterial authority and if he what he just means by that is well the pope won't be exercising his authority largely through this dicastery even that doesn't follow because i think he's already misreading the letter i think it's going to issue plenty of judgments and the pope is going to back it either in common form or specific form and i think you'll have plenty of teaching documents that guard and preserve the deposit of faith and the pope's going to back those things up as well either in common form or specific form so i think the dicastery is going to be putting out a ton of teaching documents 
That's the impression that I got from the letter. He's going to be writing a lot of teaching documents. So it's actually going to be putting out a lot of material is the impression that I get that will be magisterial. But even if not, you still have the vast majority of papal teaching authority that the Pope exercises personally. So let's, let's just say, let's say that the Pope just does away with the dicastery for the doctrine of the faith, which would be pretty foolish. Well, let's just say he does that. I mean, he has the authority to do that. He could do that. He doesn't, there's nothing essential to it. He could get rid of it. Again, I think that would be wildly unwise, but he could. And yet the papal magisterium will still be intact and the Pope will still be teaching all the time, weekly. So you would not have a suspension of the papal magisterium because the papal magisterium seems to be pretty active even without the congregation. It will issue statements about central themes of faith, but it will no longer pay as much attention to secondary doctrinal matters. But wait, those central themes of faith will still be doctrinal and magisterial in nature. So the magisterium is still going to be there, even in the dicastery. Will no longer pursue the identification and con condemnation of errors. I don't think that absolutely follows. Will no longer investigate wayward theologians and warn about their worst. I don't think that absolutely follows, but certainly not in the way that it did in, in the past. And will in general promote dialogue rather than impose a single view. Um, again, will it promote dialogue? Yes. Is it going to eventually impose a single view as far as the meaning of a proposition? Yes. Not necessarily in the way in which it's expressed, though. Hence, it will no longer do the sort of job it did under John Paul II, Benedict XVI, let alone the job that Newman says the bishops failed to do during the Arian crisis. None of that logically follows from any of any things that we've we've seen so far. And notice that it followed out consistently. This means that the teaching authority of Pope Francis himself, listen, let alone the deposit of faith, it is his job to safeguard, is not something the DDF is in the business of imposing. It, too, would simply amount to a further set of ideas to dialogue about. The implications of these recent remarks are, accordingly, quite dramatic. And while it's possible that the remarks will be clarified and qualified after Fernandez takes office, the trend of Fernandez, uh, Francis's pontificate is precisely one of avoiding clarification and qualification of theologically problematic statements. Not in all cases, but I would like to see more clarification from Pope Francis in some cases. But whereas in the past, this avoidance pertained to a handful of specific issues, it now seems as if it is being raised to the level of general DDF policy. And here we go. If so, let us hope that this temporary suspense of the functions of the teaching authority or the teaching church does not last 60 years as the previous one did. St. John Newman, pray for us. None of that follows. What in the world? None of this follows. There are so many problems to that last sentence a temporary suspense of the teaching function of the church. The congregation or the dicastery is still going to be teaching that is with papal approbation, either in common form or specific form, often. Um, but let's say it doesn't. Let's say it doesn't. Okay. But that's not even the primary mode by which the Pope teaches. The Pope generally teaches personally and not vicariously. So the papal magisterium is very, very active. So there's no way in which we can talk about a suspense of the magisterium. Zero way. And we're also talking about the papacy and it, it as an organ. The College of Bishops is still pretty active in its ordinary and universal magisterium. So even then, you still have the ordinary and universal magisterium pretty active. Could it use... Uh, could it use a, a tune-up? Could it do better in some cases? I think so. But I also think the papal office could do a little better in some areas. But it's still there. It's still teaching. It's still active. So there's no real sense in which we could talk about a temporary suspense of the teaching authority of the church today. Because the teaching authority of the church today is incredibly active, whether it's papal or the College of Bishops. It's still very, very active. And I think it's still even going to be active vicariously that is the papal magisterium, through the dicastery under Fernandez. It's still going to be active. So there's no way in which we can really talk about a temporary suspense of the functions of the teaching church. I don't know why he entertained this thesis. Unless he really believes, as he said earlier in this article, at the beginning, that the dicastery of the doctrine of the faith is the principal organ of the magisterium, 
uh, unless he really believes that. It, it's I I don't know how one could honestly argue this. Um, so I don't know. I'm kind of left scratching my head with this one. Maybe um, Phaser can come out and clarify more because this doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. The papal magisterium is still incredibly active personally. It will still be active vicariously in the dicastery. And then you also still have the ordinary and universal magisterium with the College of Bishops that's still active. Um, so there's no suspense. To entertain talk about suspense in the magisterium, a temporary suspense, I think is to prepare people to reject magisterial teachings, frankly. I am not I don't know what his intentions are specifically. That is Phaser. I don't know what his intentions are personally. So I'm not going to try to judge his intentions. But I will just say this general talk of a temporary suspense of the magisterium, I think, is being used to a certain degree, at least by some people, to prepare people to reject papal teaching authority through the archbishop. So in other words, they're preparing people to reject something that the dicastery is going to be revealing, coming out with, or that Pope Francis is going to teach. And they can kind of use this, well, there's been a suspense of the magisterium per Newman, and so I can just ignore everything. It's not fair to Newman and anything he said, but I think some people are going to try to take that and run with it to ignore, as again, to use it as an excuse to ignore the papal magisterium and say, I don't have to give religious submission of intellect and will. I can dissent from this stuff because it's not really authoritative. There's a suspense in the magisterium. Yeah, I'm not buying it. Not at all. I'm not buying this take on Newman. I'm not buying the take on Fernandez. I'm not buying the take on the Pope and his teaching authority. None of it. Anyways, hopefully this has been helpful to correct some of this. If it has, let me know in the comment section. I want to know your thoughts. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Put it in the comments. Be respectful. But I want to hear it. If you disagree, that's fine. Let me hear why. If I'm in error, that's fine. Let me hear why. Put it in the comments. Hit the like button and the subscribe button. The more you interact with the video, the more you know YouTube is going to share this on YouTube with other people and the more people will see it. So if you want other people to see this video, if you think it's beneficial, interact with it. Also, if you want to support me and what I'm doing here with the channel, check me out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. Just posted some extra patron only content on there. So certainly go and check it out. All right. We'll see you later. God bless. Hey, everybody. Just wanted to tell you about my new free ebook, Church Chaos, Biblical Insights for Confused Catholics. If you are a confused Catholic and you're thinking about leaving the Catholic Church or you're thinking about converting to the church, but you see that there's a crisis in the church and you're just unsure, this is the book for you. Again, it is free. Just simply go to reasonandtheology.com. You'll see a pop-up that comes up on your screen. Just simply click on it and you'll put in your email and it will provide you the free PDF ebook right then and there. Please Please check it out if you're confused about the situation in the Catholic Church today. ReasonInTheology.com Are you confused about how Catholic teaching authority works? With encyclicals, papal bulls, councils, and many other things, it's easy to get confused on what is authoritative and what is not. Fortunately, at MaximusInstitute.com, I have prepared a course explaining the magisterium from A to Z. Visit the website and check out the course Understanding the Magisterium for more information. So Reason in Theology is growing as a channel. As a result, there's been a number of increases in production costs. So if you're benefiting from RT, I ask that you consider supporting the channel. You can help out by contributing to the Help RT Grow fundraiser on GoFundMe. You could also consider becoming a member on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash reason in theology or become a channel member right here on YouTube. With either of these options, Patreon or a YouTube member, you'll get extra access to patron only content. You can also donate directly to RT at PayPal if you prefer that option. And you can find links to all of these resources and ways to support RT in the show description. God bless. Hey, thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button and the subscribe button. See you next time. God bless.